So hi, nice to meet you. Um, I'm Sarah from Top Hat Rank, and today we are going to be talking about the SEO side of web WordPress website migrations, which is something that we do a lot of at our agency. So migrations can be pretty stressful. You have a website, you're getting traffic, you're getting sales, and you're gonna change everything up, and you don't want it all to fall apart. You don't wanna do this. <laughs> because then I look like that. <laughs> oh, we launched our website, all the rankings fell off. How do we get them back as soon as possible? Or surprise, we launched a new design. That's not gonna be a problem, is it? It is a problem. You wanna try to prevent that from happening as much as possible. So there's a couple different types of migrations, whether you're going to a new design, a new hosting account, a new template, subdomain, you should do a transition audit regardless of the type of migration that you're doing. Otherwise, things can go wrong. You can lose all of your rankings, you can lose all of your traffic. <laughs> it can be really stressful. So when you're doing the migration, you want to prepare for the worst. Things might drop off temporarily. Google might take longer than expected to come back and recrawl the site. You might have some UX changes that affect your conversion rates. There could be other variables beyond your control, such as algorithm updates. We just had a client that launched a website a week within a week of Google's no new core algorithm update, and they just lost everything because that was just a bad time to launch the site. They didn't know it, they should have asked. <laughs> um, but mostly everything can be fixed post-launch, but you could be losing sales in the process, so you wanna try to prevent it. So here's some things that we're gonna be covering today. It's gonna get a little technical. Um, we're gonna start with evalu evaluating your new WordPress theme, then data gathering, auditing, and staging pre-launching, launching your website, and then post-launch monitoring. Ready? Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so whether you're buying a template or creating your own theme, you wanna start by evaluating what your needs are. Why are you migrating to a new site? Are you doing a redesign? Do you have new functionality that you're gonna need? What is the purpose of this change? What features are you looking for, whether you're designing your own site or you're buying a new one? Which content are you moving over? You should plan all of this out before you even start looking for your theme. And plan what your new site is gonna look like so that when you start searching for it, it's easier to find. Uh, if you're buying a new theme, these are some great, good places that you can go and look. I personally really like Theme Forest. And then before you even buy your theme, you should do a, pre, a mini pre-theme audit. So there is a web developer tool extension that's really great for an easy way to do this. And for a couple things that you wanna do using that, the first thing is to start by disabling all styles. And so then you will take the pretty theme and get rid of all the pretty stuff and make it look like this, which is a lot closer to what Google is gonna see when Google goes through the theme. And this will give you an idea if there's anything hidden in there that you might not otherwise be aware of. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna view the document outline. So the document outline is gonna give you a layout of all the H tags in the theme on the page that you're looking at. And again, this is just to make sure that everything is set up properly, that you are using proper H tag hierarchy, that you actually have an H1 tag on the page as opposed to maybe like an H5, that's your main title. And it's just stuff that you can always fix later, but it's gonna be a pain. So you might as well, if you're doing the pre-audit of the, the template ahead of time, make sure that your template has all of this stuff to begin with. So a couple other things that you wanna keep in mind, um, if you're using a page builder, is the page builder gonna add extra code into the page? which a lot of them unfortunately do, and sometimes that can end up slowing down your site because you have a lot of extra stuff in there that you don't need. It does the theme that you're gonna buy have the same templates that you currently have on your website. So if you have a blog, if you have a blog, if you have landing pages, if you have a portfolio, if you have shopping carts, you wanna make sure that you have all of the templates that you need in that theme. You also wanna make sure that it functions well in a parent-child theme relationship. So when you buy your new theme, instead of just leaving it as the main parent theme on your site, if you create it as a child theme, when you do any changes to it, you will then be able to continue to up implement any updates from the parent without it automatically erasing all the edits that you've done to your theme because the theme is a child theme. You also wanna make sure that the theme doesn't have too much for your site. If you are not an e-commerce website, then you don't need WooCommerce as part of your theme. It's just gonna add a whole bunch of extra stuff that you have to remove and could potentially slow down your site with all the extra code that's gonna be on there. A few more things to keep in mind. Does it re rely very heavily on plugins? 
Plugins are very popular, especially for WordPress, and unfortunately, plugins can also slow down your website. <laughs> So you also want to look and see if there's any full width images or featured images. If it's a full width image, again, this can slow down the site. This can affect your rankings since page speed is a big part of um, the algorithm now. You also want to see if there's any room for widgets. So if you're trying to keep a similar design to a legacy website, a lot of older websites have uh, sidebars where there are a lot of widgets. And if your new theme doesn't have widgets, then you need to know how you're going to be transitioning that sidebar content into your new theme. There's more. <laughs> so make sure that you also uh, have schema included in your theme. Schema markup is super important. It does all of this nice fancy stuff in search results where you can put in um, star ratings, where you can put in prices, you can do videos, and it can be a real pain to implement yourself. So if you're starting off with a theme that already has it in there, then you're already gonna be way ahead in the game. So schema, if you're not super familiar, so schema is basically a way for your website to chew up the food and all the content and give it to all the little baby birds that are the search engines. So like Google and Bing and Yandex. Yahoo doesn't get any because Yahoo fell out of the nest. <laughs> uh, so another thing that you want to look at when it comes to schema is you can just put the theme itself into the structured data, data testing tool and it'll just come right out and tell you, and there's a link to that at the bottom here, It'll tell you if there are any schema errors in the theme before you even buy it. And when you're looking through that, you want to see if the schema errors are specifically in the theme itself or in the content, because it's something that built, is built into the theme that's going to be much more difficult to change. Whereas as if it's an error in the content, then that's not really a problem for you since you're going to have different content than what's in the template. You also want to check and see if the code is valid. So the validator at W3 is a good way to kind of get a good idea about that. Don't go too crazy with it because the validator is pretty much always going to tell you that there's some sort of problem. Um, so as long as you're just trying to keep the problems to, to a minimum, you should be pretty good. You want to make sure that your pagination is properly implemented, um, which we will talk more about later. And we also absolutely want to make sure that it is mobile friendly. We are now in a mobile first index. So mobile friendly is extremely important. Okay, so moving on, data, data gathering, auditing, and staging. Ready? Excited? <laughs> All right, so you wanna make sure that you're not bringing anything bad over from your old site to your new site. So start by checking Google Search Console. Check your index coverage reports, see if there's anything that's coming up that's not being indexed, that's being excluded or has errors, and then why, and then try to fix that. See if, if you're still using the old Google Search Console, there's a section that had HTML improvements that you could go in and look at. You could also check for any manual actions such as security warnings. In the old days, they, uh, they actually sent you manual warnings if you had penalties. So you wanted to make sure that anything that was there got cleaned up as well. You also want to check your XML sitemaps and see how those are working in Search Console and how Google is going through and indexing that content. You then you want to crawl your site. So here's a couple tools that you can use for crawling your site. Uh, my favorite is Screaming Frog. That's what I use all the time. So you want to check, you want to do a crawl of your site and then also a crawl of your sitemaps because sometimes the, the spider will go through and find things on your site that's not in your sitemap and vice versa. So this way you're getting all of the data for everything that's on your website. You could also do a log file analysis to see if there's any weird status codes that are coming up that you might not find through crawlers. And then you also want to look at your Google Analytics data to check for orphans and see if you have any redirect chains. So when it comes to looking for orphans, um, SEMrush has a really good tool for doing this. So if you connect your Google Analytics account to a project in SEMrush, it'll help you identify orphan pages. Um, if anyone's not familiar with the term orphan pages, that is when you have a page on your website that is not linked to from anywhere else on your website. So there's no way to navigate to it. So it's still in Google's index, but it's just kind of hanging out, out there away from the majority of your site. You also want to avoid chain redirects. So Google will not follow more than five chain redirects. And chain redirect is when you go from one to two to three to four and just hopping all the way through rather than having a redirect that goes from one all the way to five. So as you're doing your analysis of your current site, you also want to look at your backlinks because that's very important when you're doing a migration as well. You want to export all of your backlink data. There's a couple different ways to do this. So you can get it from Google Search Console or any of these tools that are on the left. And you want to also check if you have a disavow file and if you do export that data as well. 
put everything into a spreadsheet, remove du duplicates, clean it all up, and then sort it by page popularity. So what pages have the most clean live links? And if you're doing a migration and you're getting rid of some of your content, if your content has a lot of links to it, you might wanna consider using that page. You can always redirect to another page on your website. However, you lose a little bit of authority when you're doing a 301 redirect. So it's a little bit of a risk if you're deciding to get rid of a page that has a lot of links going to it. So you also want to evaluate the risk of the pages that you have in your disavow file. So if there's a lot of links in your disavow file that are pointing to a page, you might want to remove that page since you're now changing up your website and just change the URL to something else because that way you're removing the bad links that are coming into your site by killing off the page. And if you do that, you would want to have that page that you're killing off return a 410 error if possible. 410 is permanently removed, whereas a 404 is temporarily removed. So a 410, if Google sees that, it will not come back and try to recrawl that page. So a way to get backlink data for free if you don't want to use any of those paid tools. So you can do this using Search Console and Screaming Frog, which is free for the first 500 links that you want to crawl. So you can go to Search Console and export your backlink data. And then we're, this is the steps, and I'm going to go through this a little more in detail. So install Screaming Frog, and then you're going to do a custom XPath extraction, which is in Screaming Frog. Um, and then you can crawl your backlinks and extract the data, which so on the list of URLs, it will tell you what URL the website is linking to on your site, the anchor text, and also if it's a follow or no follow link. So you need all of that data when you're evaluating your backlink profile. So to do that, you start by going to Google Search Console and extracting your links, put it all out there into a spreadsheet. And you can just take pictures of this as we go because there's going to be technical stuff in here that you don't necessarily need to know how to do. You can just take pictures. So in Screaming Frog, um, this is how you set up an XPath extraction. So what this is essentially saying is that to look on, and you would want to replace where it says astronomics, you want to put your website in there instead. So you would, this is basically saying, find the link that goes to this URL, then find the anchor text, and then find the attribute for that anchor text. So then when you crawl it, so you go, you change it to list mode, you put in your, there we go, you put in your list of links from Google Search Console and it's gonna crawl because this is all that Google Search Console gives you. It doesn't tell you that Cloudy Nights is linking to this page on your website with this anchor text. So this is the way that you get that information out of your Google Search Console links. So once the crawl is done, then you go to a custom and extraction. And so now it's gonna say, okay, here's all the URLs that you gave me from Google Search Console. And now here is where it's linking to on your website. And it's also gonna give you the anchor text and the attribute. And that's a free way to get all of the data that the paid tools will also do for you if you don't wanna do this manually. Okay, going back to where we were. <laughs> so after you've evaluated um, your backlinks, you wanna get really obsessive about your page level data. So before you even do anything, go through, use Screaming Frog, again, I would say, um, and get a copy, a record of everything that's currently on your website. So that if something goes wrong, once you're doing this migration, you have a record of what was there and you can revert it back to what it was. So you wanna know what all of your headings are, you wanna know where all of your internal links are going, what keywords you're ranking for, have a record of your traffic and conversions, your page speed, are you getting any featured snippets? So this is to protect yourself later on in case you need to go backwards and there's a problem and you need to figure out what happened. So then you wanna start with auditing your current website. Start with the basics. So look at your duplicate page titles, see if you have any content issues, server issues, check your URLs. Do you have canonicals that are set up? So self-referencing canonicals on every page. Is your pagination set up correctly? What's your siloing look like? Uh, do you have proper or <coughs> organization on your site? Are you using breadcrumbs? Breadcrumbs are a really important secondary signal that a lot of people overlook. Um, do you have anything in your robots.txt file that's blocking pages? Do you have pages that are competing in focus with each other? Another big problem that a lot of people overlook is that Google's only going to pick one page on your web website to rank for specific keywords. So if you have multiple different pages that all cover the same keyword sets, they're competing with each other, not just everyone else that's out there on the web. And Google doesn't know which one of your page is the one best page. 
So it kind of just throws up its hand and doesn't rank any of them. So make sure you only have one page for each focus topic on your website. And so before you do your migration and set up your new site on a staging server, you want to fix all of this stuff first as much as possible. And the benefit from doing that is that you can start to get better crawl efficiency and better rankings on your current website while you're still setting up your migration and getting your staging site all fixed up. In general, in my experience, migrations take a little bit of time. So why not start to get the benefits right away from what's out there and then maybe by the time you launch, could be like three months from now, you're already seeing an upward movement before you start moving to your next site. So when it comes to pagination, um, Google recently came out like within a couple, like a week or so ago, saying that users really prefer to have a view all page rather than paginated pages. So if you have a view all page and paginated pages, you want to make sure that you have a canonical setup on your paginated pages that points to your view all page so that you're not getting any errors with duplicate content. If you have paginated pages, you also have to have rel next and rel previous attributes set up going between each one. Again, Google just came out <laughs> and said that they don't use rel next and rel previous for indexing. However, that doesn't mean that they don't use it for crawling. It doesn't mean that Bing doesn't use it or Yandex doesn't use it. There's more search en engines out there than just Google. So I still think that doing rel next and rel previous is a good thing to do, even if Google is not using it as much as they originally to told us that they were. And also they change their mind all the time. So just because they're not using it now doesn't mean they're not gonna be using it in six months. So it's still a good thing to do in a lot of uh, WordPress themes, especially if you're using the Yoast plugin, this will just be done automatically. So it's just a good practice to just put it in there. So as you're auditing your site, you wanna make sure that you have fixed all of your in-content redirects. You don't wanna have any 301 redirects internally that you can avoid. So if you have a, a blog post that's going to an old page that's now redirecting to the new URL, go to the link in that blog post and change that link to go to the final URL. So like I said earlier, you do lose a little bit of authority in with a 301 redirect. So if it's within your control, you might as well just fix it and that way you're getting all of the value out of your link that you can. Um, and then you also wanna make sure that you're not doing any redirects to canonicalized pages. So don't have a redirect that's going to a page that's then canonicalized to a different page. So if you have a canonical setup from one page to another, the canonical is pointing to a page and you're telling Google that is the main page that should be in search engines. So if you're redirecting to a page that's then pointing to another page, you're sending conflicting signals and it's almost like a hop redirect, um, but it's, it's not a good practice because a canonical is not like a directive, like something you would put in your robots file, it's more a suggestion. So you need to have all of the signals on your website lined up correctly in order for Google to pay attention to that canonical. So, okay, so when it comes to chain and hop redirects, as we mentioned earlier, a hop redirect is going from A to B to C. Instead of doing this, you want to do this. So go from A to C and B to C. So that way you're getting rid of the redirect from A to B and you're eliminating the hop. Make sure that you don't have any 404 errors that should not be there. So no internal links that are going to 404s. Again, it's within your control. You can go through and just either remove those links or change the links to go to the correct place. Make sure you don't have any redirects going to a 404 or canonicals that are going to a 404. Because again, if you have a canonical on a page that's going to a 404, Google's gonna come to that page, follow the canonical, and the page with the canonical is not gonna get indexed because it's going to a different page that has a 404. If you have a real 404, something that's really gone, that is not on your website anymore, that's okay. Just make sure that you remove any internal links that are going to it. And if possible, it's better to return, to return a 410 response code as opposed to a 404, since again, Google will not come back and continue to recrawl it if it's a 410. So after you've made these changes to your live site, get all your data, again. <laughs> So again, a backup, a lot of this is really repetitive and really tedious, but so you have the first crawl, which was the data of your website that was currently there. This crawl is now gonna be the data of your website now that you've cleaned it up and done an audit. And again, this is just in case something happens, you can go back and do comparisons between the two and see what changed and why you would be getting better or worse ranking. So once that's done, then you're gonna clone your website and put it on a staging server somewhere. 
then apply your new theme that you just bought or created. Block it from robots, put it behind a password. Do not do this because Google will still find it. No index follow does not work. Um, you're telling Google to no index, but still follow it. That will not work. Make sure it is no index, no follow, blocked via robots, completely hidden. But you do also want to make sure that it's visible for you to crawl it whenever you need to. So as you're doing the transition audit. Um, so just putting a no index, no follow directive in the meta robots will do that. So next, we're going into um, pre-launching and getting ready to make the move. So now that you've put everything in your staging environment, brought over all of the content, you want to make sure that everything's working correctly. You don't want to have a toilet with toilet paper around the corner, because that's not working correctly. <laughs> so make sure that all of your buttons work. Make sure that it looks good in mobile and that it's responsive. Make sure all of your breadcrumbs have been brought over. Check if you have any spelling errors. You'd be surprised how often that happens. Make sure that if you have a, a blog archive or a category archive that it's showing excerpts as a, instead of full posts. So this is stuff that you might not be able to find by doing the crawler, so it's important, important to do manual visual checks as well. So then, after that's done, you want to crawl your site again. <laughs> Very repetitive. So crawl through your site. Um, again, I use Screaming Frog all the time. You want to make sure that none of the issues that were on your site before have made it over. You want to make sure that everything that you cleaned up is now part of the new website so that it's all functioning correctly. If you're changing any of your URLs, you should have now a full list of the live URLs on your website from your crawl. And you want to make sure that those are getting carried over to your new site or they're being redirected. Ideally, try to keep your URLs the same as much as possible rather than doing redirects. But if you have to do a redirect, a 301 redirect is the way to go. So then you're going to compare the two, the two crawls that you have of your cleaned up website and your new website on the staging server and make sure everything's there. One of the best ways to make sure that all of your URLs are getting moved over is if you just export all of the pages from the crawl you did of your live website and then replace the domain with the domain of your staging website, and then just run a list crawl through Screaming Frog, and it'll just go through and tell you if those are live pages or, or if they're 404 pages. It's a quick, easy way to make sure that you're not losing any of the pages. And then you need to go through and manually review, similar to what you did when you were doing the review of the theme before you bought it, because stuff happens. <laughs> you might miss something at some point, um, and it's just a good idea to have redundancies and to check, check, check again. So you don't want to make sure that there's nothing hidden in the page. For example, there's an H1 tag that's available there in the code, um, which you was found using the web developer tool app, um, but it's not actually showing on the page. So it's something that you would want to fix before you move forward with these pages. Um, you want to re review any internal linking. This is a really important signal um, within your website. Make sure that all of your linking is still in place, that you're bringing it over what was pre-existing on your website that's working over to your new website. So this is what we do when we have someone come to us um, and they are doing a migration. So I'll just go through and literally like put red markers on everything. This should be this, this should be this. You should add this here, move stuff around. So making sure that everything is as cleaned up as possible. So once your site is as cleaned up as it can be, you've brought over all of your data from your new fixed up website that's now live. We're almost ready. We just want to test your redirects. Make sure that you have any redirect that was previously on your live website is still getting carried over because you probably would have seen during your backlink evaluation, there could be some links going to old URLs that are no longer on your live website that are being redirected. So you still want to have the value of those links by making sure that the, the redirect is carrying over. Make sure that all of your redirects are 301 permanent redirects. A 302 redirect is a temporary redirect and it does not pass any authority whatsoever. You also want to make sure that you're, again, avoiding internal redirects, avoiding internal chains. You want to test www versus non-ww. One needs to redirect to the other. Google will see them as two different versions of the website. Same thing with HTTP or HTTPS, uppercase, lowercase, trailing slash, no trailing slash. Very easy ways to inadvertently do present duplicate copies of your website to Google, which could create all sorts of duplicate content problems. So make sure, okay, so yeah, now that we've made sure all of our redirects uh, from the old site are going to your new URLs, then we're ready, we're good, we're ready to launch. 
just make sure you don't forget to unblock Robux. <laughs> so now that you've gone through the trouble of hiding your website, un undo hiding your website because that is a, also a very common thing to overlook. It's when you push the new site live, you've forgotten to remove robots and then all of a sudden everything tanks and you're like, why? It's like, well, because you told Google not to index your site. So, okay, and now we launch. Launch the website. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so now that the website is live, you want to check um, index coverage reports and do this on an ongoing basis. This is something that's available in Search Console. You want to check that your sitemaps are being crawled and that everything is being indexed and that your pages crawled per day is not dropping. So if your pages crawled per day is dropping, that means there's something on your website that is blocking your pages. And that is definitely not good and something you would need to fix. So if you're looking at an index coverage report, it'll tell you what URLs are being excluded. Just go, if you just click on that, it'll tell you why underneath there will be lists as far as this was ex excluded because it was blocked by robots or because of this or that. And sometimes it's okay to have pages that are excluded. In general, it's a good idea to exclude your uh, blog tag pages from index because it doesn't really bring any additional value. It just creates index bloat. They're not landing pages that people are gonna come to from search to your site. And so by blocking those, it's a good thing. So it's actually gonna show, if it's showing up under excluded, it's okay. You just wanna make sure that everything that's under excluded is meant to be there and that nothing is incorrectly set up. So you wanna continue to monitor your keywords. This is a tool that we use all the time, Agency Analytics. Um, it's really great because it allows you to just put in any keywords that you want to track and it's gonna update the position of that keyword every 16 hours. So if something goes wrong, you can find out pretty immediately within like a day or two if the keywords just start to drop. And then this is also from Agency Analytics. So you wanna keep an eye on any ranking fluctuations that happen. So this will tell you, it, this tool tells you here's the position that you're ranking for and then the URL that is ranking as well. And so if you have situations like this where there are two URLs that Google is switching back and forth between when it's choosing which page to rank, that means that you have some competing focus between those pages. And so Google's not sure which page is the right page to rank. And so you need to remove that competing focus in order to tell Google this is the one page that you should be focusing on because otherwise eventually it's gonna hurt your rankings. Um, this is SEMrush. It's a good way to monitor the total keywords for your entire website, not just the ones that you would potentially put into agency analytics. Um, it, so this is a good tool and it separates it by where you are in position as far as the, um, the bar graph. And you can toggle on and off and there's like, it's a really powerful tool. There's a lot of really good information in here if you wanna end up playing around with that. So then back in Search Console, you also want to monitor your click-through rates. So you should have taken a note of this before you launched, what your current click-through rates were, and then you can compare them to your current click-through rates. Make sure that nothing is dropping off. And this could potentially not even be an SEO issue. This could just be a design issue. If, you, someone, if your users don't like the new design of your websites, your conversion rates might start to drop. And then you might want to revert back to your original site and then pick a new website and try again. <laughs> Um, and then you can also set up monitoring for site changes. So these are a couple tools that you can do, use to do this. It'll give you notices when your website is down, if your server response code, if you have any like 500 server response codes. Um, Little Warren will tell you if you have someone that, if you are not making the updates to your website, Lauren, Little Warren will tell you, give you a history of like, oh, this page title was changed at this day and this H tag was changed this, this day. So it's really helpful to keep track of what's been changed on your website, especially if you're not the developer that's implementing that stuff. Um, and then continue to crawl your website on a regular basis, because you never know what's gonna change. Even if you're not con adding content to a blog or adding new products or something like that, you don't know what's gonna happen. There's a lot of other things that are out there beyond your control that could affect your website. You could potentially get hacked. And if you're not paying attention, if you're not crawling your site, if you're not monitoring your search, your search console, that could go unforeseen for who knows how long. That's it. Questions? <laughs> no? We've got plenty of time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yes. I'm sorry, but 
some of this stuff is like way beyond my yeah <laughs> and I'm, I'm gonna ask a question that's sure. probably like really dumb but i just don't know what is a bread crown so breadcrumbs are when you go visually when you go to the page and if you're as a user you're looking at the page and it says something like home and then um, like services and then like the name of the category of the services and so it's a link path essentially that's put on the page that users can use to go between the different silos of how it's set up. So for search engines, it's really important because you're creating rela relationships between the silos. So if you have, so for example, if you have um, a blog, so your blog post should have breadcrumbs on it that say home, blog, and then the blog post. And that way Google knows that this blog post exists within the blog. So you, it's a way of organizing everything on your website. Okay, thank you. So it's like the menu that you have underneath the main category in the home page. But it doesn't have to be like in your main navigation. It can be, um, so you have your main navigation and then you have the page below it and then the breadcrumbs can be just, because it changes per page and per part of the website, whereas your navigation is gonna be the same regardless of the page that you're on. And if you're using Yoast SEO for a WordPress site, there's a checkbox that you can just say, enable breadcrumbs, and it'll do it for you. Good question. <laughs> Good question. Yes. So the description you gave when you were going through this was specific to switching themes. Yes. What about if you're completely switching over from, like, say, a site that was developed by another developer mm -hmm. and did their own hosting, and then you're taking over and you're essentially recreating using verbatim everything that was there because yeah. maybe it was terrible to with, it was laid out poorly and all of that. Um, the process is going to be mostly the same. You want to make sure that you're doing full, a full crawl and audit of everything that you had as you're bringing it over. Um, I think, are you, would you be changing domains as well or just changing um, the hosting well, account? Well, it's a two-part question there. Okay. We're mostly sticking with the same domain because it's okay. better. But, um, yeah, so. If you're... Yeah, if you're, if you're keeping the same domain, then it's pretty much the same process where you want to make sure that you've collected all of the data from everything that was on the old website. Um, and then you're, you've done a full audit of the new website and make sure that all of the good stuff that was on your old website is getting transferred over. Um, Google doesn't really care so much where you're hosted. So if you're moving hosting accounts, that shouldn't be that much of a problem. The only thing to look out for there is uh, the server response time because that can affect page speed. Um, and that is something that Google does care about. But if you're changing domains, the other thing that you would want to do there is you'd want to submit a change of address request to Google. Um, so that way, and redirect everything from the old domain to the new domain and leave the old domain up for 980 days um, while the change of address takes place. And that way Google will go through your new domain and replace all of the old URLs that it has in its index with the new domain. Okay. <laughs> what about the, the content changes though? So if you're ranking for a particular page, mm -hmm. you've changed a lot of the copy on that page. Is that going to it could. Um, you, the biggest thing to make sure for that is that you're keeping your page titles and your H tags the same because those are a more important ranking factor than the actual content. Um, when it comes to the content, you want to try to keep the length the same um, as far as what you're moving over. If you're just making a couple like updates or moving things around, that shouldn't be too much of a problem as long as all of your other ranking signals are still there and in place. Um, if you're removing a lot of keywords from your content, that would be a problem because the keyword saturation in your content is also important. So that's something to be mindful of if you're editing and taking stuff out. You just want to make sure that you're still, you're still giving Google enough information that it needs on, to understand what the page is about and to rank it. Sure. Is that your cat? No, <laughs> I, I, have, I have three cats and they love boxes, but. <laughs> but that Can one's not like. Yeah. Um, giving Google enough information and mm -hmm. keywords and things. Can you talk more about that? About keywords and what? I know each industry is different. Yeah. Specific keywords, but. So, as 
When it comes, try, Google's kind of moved away from specific keywords and it's moved more towards topics. So try to think of it more in terms of topics than just keywords because it's no longer about how many times can I fit this one keyword on this page. So Google understands through latent semantic, semantic indexing what words are related to each other as well. So even if you're not including your specific keyword on that page, you could have other things on there that are variations that will still feed enough information to Google. So where you want to have your main keywords is in your page title and your H tag. And then the content on the page should be written more for users than for search engines since readability is also part of the algorithm. You want to make sure that you're not stuffing keywords in there and that it actually makes sense to a human viewer. And that the content is really quality. It's not being copied from someone else. You're not repeating yourself. Quality is super important because that adds to authority, which is another ranking factor. So making sure that your content is like really good content and you're not just bloating it to fill up the page. It would be better to have like a paragraph of like really solid content than three paragraphs of like content that's not so great. And that's all part of the analytics that's read into what's good content? So yeah, Google understands what good, good <laughs> content is at this point. So there's, um, oh, I forget the name of the test, but there, there's a readability test um, that Google looks through where it evaluates even the level that you're, that you're writing on. And different industries will rank based on different levels of writing. So if you're a medical website, you're gonna be writing at more of like a college level. And so Google can decipher that by looking at the words that you're using, the number of syllables in the words and the number of words within a sentence. So if you have more syllables and more words, it assumes that you're writing at a higher level. And so if you're a, someone that should be a more authoritative website, you should be writing at that higher level. Whereas if you're a, a kindergarten teacher, you don't need to have like these, you know, giant words and giant sentences and you would be writing at a lower level and that is what would be ranking. So, yes. And it's kind of a balancing act because with Yoast SEO, they don't want your sentences to run too long. Right. It completely depends on the industry that you're in. Um, and Yoast does use that same test um, that Google looks at as well. I keep, I'm forgetting the name of it. It starts with a K. Um, and so Yoast will give you kind of like a, a general guide. And th but that's playing more towards the like gen common denominator. So it's going to vary a little based on industry to industry. And the best thing to do if you really want to look at readability is just search Go to Google, search for the keyword that you want to be ranking for, then t look at the page that's ranking and run that through the readability test. And then that'll pump out whatever score it is. I think it goes from like 10 to 30 and then 40 to 50. And it'll tell you, and a SEMrush, that tool also does this as well and will compare your website to other websites based on re readability. That's one of the things that it does. Um, so is there, um, I'm sorry, I know you mentioned it, but is there a URL to go to find the readability test? It's, if I remember the name of it, if you Google the name of it, <laughs> if you Google like algorithm readability test or even um, SEMrush readability, readability test, it should come up. I, it starts with a K and it's hyphenated. Um, I'm not remembering the name of it right now though. <laughs> yes. If you have a client that wants to um, move from like, let's say Weebly or Wix WordPress, is it the same migration process? Yes, um, it depends on how their Weebly site was created. Um, I know that at least in the past, a Weebly, Weebly had a lot of flash that they were using, um, which would be really difficult to migrate because you really don't want to include the flash because it's not something that Google can read. So then actually moving to WordPress would be a vast improvement because then it's a, your content is a whole lot more indexable. Um, but in general, it would be a, a similar process of just making sure that you're bringing over all of the key elements that you need from the website that's working, regardless of the platform that it's on. And I think actually WordPress would be better than Weebly because Weebly, given the, the page builder that's there, puts a lot of extra stuff in the code um, that's really not going to help you and could slow down your site, whereas WordPress doesn't do that as much. So let's walk through a scenario. Uh, we, my client is Hank Hill, who sells propane and propane accessories. And we've successfully launched a new site for him. It looks great. 
However, he really wants to ring for propane, and he obviously has maybe 50 pages about propane and propane accessories. Mm -hmm. So how do we get Hank to not keyboard, uh, keyboard cannibalize across the site? Um, so you would probably want to create, you would probably either want to rank the, the home page or a category page for that. So rather than having all of your different products competing with each other, if you put the products in one category and then put breadcrumbs on the products that say all of these products live in this category, then Google, Google is going to attribute the value of the keyword to the category. So that's another reason for having breadcrumbs is it helps to organize everything and that way Google doesn't think that all of your pages are on the same level and that way they don't ha all have the same importance. So if you focus everything on the category or the home page and make sure your category page titles and are well optimized and you have H tags with, con with keywords in there and then on your product pages, maybe you don't have propane tanks as the first thing in the page title. Maybe it's, I don't know two gallon propane tanks or whatever. Because it, for page titles, the most important part of it is what's at the beginning, and that's gonna have even more weight. So even if you have to put propane tanks in that title, because that's what it is, put that more towards the end, and that way it'll allow the category or homepage, um, whichever you thought would be better, to, to have more weight and to rank. And then your, your separate product pages would then rank for the more long tail searches, like. 20 gallon propane tank, which would, if you get rank for that and bring in traffic for that, then that's super qualified traffic because <laughs> that's exactly what they're looking for. So, but definitely breadcrumbs would be really important for that to make sure that it's not competing. Yes, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Flesh Kincaid. Yes. Yeah. Hyphenated had a K. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. The readability score. We still have five <laughs> yes. I have a question for a theme, uh, like the 2017 theme. I don't know if you're aware of that. It, it, it kind of uh, it shows other pages on the homepage. You know, you can scroll okay. Like a long scroll. They are created separately as separate WordPress pages, but they show up. How, how does SEO work with something like that? Does the URL change when you go to the different pages? If you don't get to the page. You know, it's yeah. yeah, but is the if as long as there's a separate URL that it's kind of like when you have um, if you've ever seen a paginated page that's using push state where if you scroll through it updates to page one page two when it reloads and so as long as it has a separate URL Google will consider that a separate page because there's a separate URL and it evaluate that portion of the page as if it's attributed to that URL. I personally prefer to have everything in separate pages just because that way you're not leaving it up to Google to decide <laughs> and make sure that they're crawling it correctly because stuff happens. Yeah. Um, but as long as there's different URLs for the different pages, then that's okay. Yeah. So um, what would be the 101 version of what you just talked about? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so basically, um, if you're so if you're migrating your website, make sure that you do a full crawl of your website, back up all of your data so that you have everything. Um, do an audit of that website to make to see if there's any things that should be changed as far as like your page titles or your h tags. Um, understand the pages that you want to migrate over and make sure that those are being, you're keeping the same URL if possible on your new website. Um, you can do a 301 redirect if needed, but it would be better to keep the same URL. Um, do a review of your backlinks to see what pages links are going to on your website and make sure that those URLs are either being kept or redirected because you don't want to lose all of your backlinks just by moving to another design. Um, and then once you have all of that data, put your website on a staging server. Again, crawl it, make sure there's nothing hidden in there that you're not aware of. Make sure all of the, the positive factors on your website are getting moved over. Um, do a manual check to see that everything is working correctly, it's functioning correctly. Make sure that it's responsive. Mobile is super, super important. Um, check your page speed. The uh, page speed insights is Google's latest tool to check page page speed. What's it called? Page speed insights. 
um, and that'll give you a score for both desktop and mobile and things that, and don't go too crazy with that either because Google's, oh, there's always going to be something that can be fixed in there. So, but there's a lot of, um, especially when it comes to like WordPress, it'll say like you need to minify, minify JavaScript in your CSS files. There are plugins that can do that for you. So don't go, don't like freak out like I don't know how to do this. WordPress is great because it has a lot of plugins that will do a lot of these things. Like uh, WP uh, Rocket and WP Fast, Fast Cache are good for speeding up your site. Um, and then so once you have completely set up your new design on your staging server, you've brought over all your content, everything's working correctly, all your redirects are in place, um, then launch your website and continue to monitor it through Google Search Console, um, through craw crawls of your own in case there's something that you miss, in case something happens later on. Um, and yeah, Google Search Console is gonna really be the best way to know if something's going wrong quickly because you'll start to see your impressions drop off. You'll start to see pages being excluded. Um, so that's definitely the, the tool to keep an eye on once uh, you launch your new site. We're done? Okay. <laughs> one last question. Do you have like a top three fave themes for WordPress that seems to really? Um, Enfold works pretty good. Uh, Udesign. Um, Divi, well, Divi also has a page. Anything with a Divi page builder is probably pretty pretty good because that's used on a couple different themes. Um, and yeah, the Divi the Divi page builder is pretty good as well. So that's probably so it's a good N -fold, one. So Enfold. Yeah, E N F O L D. Enfold. That was the one in the examples. Enfold. Okay. And yeah. then what was the second one? You design. U, the letter U, design. Okay. So those are generally pretty good to start off with. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Scott.